So first and foremost, there should be a connect card somewhere near you. If you're not getting any information from us, um, that's either for you a total blessing or a real negative. Uh, we would love to get your name and your email, and we can make sure you get the e-newsletter every week. We can say hi, help you along in your spiritual journey. Nothing we do here at Mountainside is uh, of any pressure. We're simply offering different ways to help you in your, in your Christian life. And so if you wanted to fill one of those out, you can always fill one out and put it in an offering box at the uh, back of the sanctuary. Should have received a, um, a bulletin when you came in briefly. We've got a number of things coming up. Uh, so no youth group tonight. Let me make, make sure and say that. No youth group tonight. Um, but also a few upcoming events next Sunday is our soup and salad potluck here after church. So next Sunday, soup and salad potluck. The sanctuary will be blown up again. Uh, there'll be tables and, and chairs around. So uh, bring a soup or a salad to share, and it'll be right after church. Saturday, Feb September, or Saturday, February 25th, the glasses are coming. It's getting bad. It's getting bad. I wear at home, I wear my wife's reading glasses, but I can't wear those on stage. So Saturday, Feb February 25th, women's tea party. So I wanted to show you the, uh, the new way we're doing this. So if you get the e-news letter, which you should, or you go online, you'll see these. I'm going to walk you through this. If you're, or if you're my age or older, I'm going to help you now. You can click on tea party. That takes you to a screen where, uh, is it big enough there? Yeah. Uh, you need to let us know that you're not a robot because they're slowly taking over the world now. Um, so we're asking you to sign up online for these. You're going to start getting these RSVPs. It just lets us know how much tea Abby needs to brew or something. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. So you can, you can sign up and then, and then it will tell you your, what you're registering for. And this will be for all of the events. And then you put how many people are coming, what's your name, and then your email. And so that's easy enough. And then for the women, I can help bring food or drink. A baked good, uh, and they need six, two, well, that's a lot. So for the men, uh, when you come to an event, we provide everything. Because if we ask the men to do this, they would get to that screen and they'd go, I'm out. Like, that's gone. It's only checked out. But the women, you can do this. You can bring a, a treat to share. So uh, uh, sign up. Will you need child care? Yes or no? Important. Just let us know. So we're trying to get, and then it will confirm you've successfully registered, and then it will give you a whole bunch of more things that are coming up. Embrace the new technology like I'm trying to do. Everything I used to do is on a piece of paper, and now I'm being pushed to go to software and checking in and letting people know. So here's my best comparison. We do not run a business here at Mountainside. We run a family. If your, if your mother invited everybody for Thanksgiving, it would only be appropriate to RSVP to her and say, yes, there's five of us coming, Mom. What can I bring? That's kind of how I want you to think of Thanksgiving dinner, sort of like the stuff that we're doing here. Yep. Yes, Abby, I'm coming. What can I bring? So as a church family, uh, it'll, it'll work out. So thank you for doing that. We appreciate it. And then Saturday... March 4th, men's breakfast. Men, don't bring anything. We don't trust what you bring. We, it's probably half cooked or burned. Uh, our men will be uh, making breakfast for that Saturday, March 4th. And that time, at this time, it'll be here at Mountainside. So we host four churches, and we're going to do that six times a year. So men's breakfast is also coming up. And um, let me, before we get going, let me pray. Father God, I do thank you for each and every person who's here. Uh, Father, we love them, but most importantly, you love them. Pray that you would open our hearts and our minds this morning to this topic that is uh, extremely important, but can also be frustrating and hard to understand at times. So I pray that you would give us wisdom. Thank you for your word. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So we've been going through the Gospel of Luke. We're going to take a break um, this morning as we discuss. Um, oh, you know what? I forgot. Anybody doing the spiritual fitness challenge? I have people telling me they're actually doing it. So thank you. Bring these home. Grab a card and bring it home. This week, this is a tough one, practice love. We're supposed to do that as Christians. I don't know if you knew that. 
Show someone love in a tangible way every day this week. Ask God to give you eyes that see the needs of others. So spiritual fitness challenge of the week, practice love. So we're in the gospel of Luke now, uh, or have been, and we're going to take a break for a topic that I teach on once a year that I think is really important. So last week we uh, did the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus starts three and a half years, three and a half years of public ministry. It ends with his crucifixion. After Jesus is crucified, I don't know, I don't want to ruin the story for you. If you're watching The Chosen, they haven't gotten here yet. He raises from the dead. So I ruined the story just a little bit, but he does. And when he rises from the dead, he meets with his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, and he tells them this, one of his last meetings here on earth. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is crucified, he rises from the dead, and then he tells his disciples immediately to what? Get to work. Move forward. Tell other people the good news of the gospel. It doesn't take very long for Jesus to tell his disciples that this is the best thing that you can do. This is the best, most useful way to use your life is to tell people about me. Now, a lot of people think that Matthew 28 is Jesus's last words here on earth. They would be wrong. Jesus's very last words are recorded in the book of Acts. So Acts chapter one, and I'm gonna read verses six through 11. These are Jesus's last words. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom into Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth. That rings a bell. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus is crucified, he's resurrected, and he's what? Ascended. He ascends into the right hand of the Father where he sits in a position of power, waiting to return. Now we have here, uh, or Jesus says, it is not for you to know times or seasons. In Mark 13, 32, Jesus also says that no one will know his time of return except the Father. So why in the world, and it, this happens around like the year 2000, or uh, I think the last time it happened was in the 80s or the 90s, why are people still spending time trying to figure out a date where Jesus is going to return? Jesus has made it clear twice in his word, nobody knows the date. So I'm telling you this, if you read it in the Bible and Jesus says people don't know the date, if you find out someone who's writing a new book about the date, why would you pay that person money to be a heretic? Don't give them time. Don't give them an ear. Don't listen to them. Jesus already said it. And then I'm amazed at how many times this happens over and over and over and people are led astray and that's not right. Don't give those people attention. But notice in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to help us with evangelism. Evangelism is a large word. Typically when I say the word evangelism in the past, 
people go, that sounds scary and terrible and I don't know what to do and I don't know how to do it and does that mean I have to go and hand out tracts or go and yell at someone or go knock on doors? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't want to get in a fight. I'm scared. But evangelism is part of the DNA of every Christian. The, the how of what you're doing DNA, we'll talk of how we do evangelism, we'll talk about that. But it would be the most loving thing anybody could do is tell other people about Jesus. It's the most loving thing you could do. Amen. The most unloving thing you could do is not tell anybody about Jesus. They need to come to Christ. People need to find Jesus. They need to move from the darkness into the light. People need Christ. So I'm going to walk us through evangelism. I'm going to give you all a plan today. Um, that's the goal today, that you leave uh, this Sunday, you leave these doors with a plan for evangelism. And I believe it's a plan that can work for each and every person. So in Acts chapter 1, the Holy Spirit is promised. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. And at the end of Acts chapter 2, Acts 2.41, we, re we read, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So Acts 1, Jesus says the, the Holy Spirit will come and empower you to be a witness. Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches this dynamic sermon and the Holy Spirit comes and people are actually saved. So what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come and empower you to be a witness. He comes, he empowers to be a witness and 3,000 souls get saved that day. Now I know that everyone here wants people to find Jesus. I know that. You do I do. We want people to walk with Christ. We want people to repent of their sin. We want them to come to Christ. We want them to, Jesus even says, teaching them to obey what? All of my commands. Why? Because by living under the commands of Christ, you are better, others are better, our society is better. Everyone is better when we live the way that Christ wants us to live. Everyone is worse when we do what is right in our own eyes, it's called sin. And it makes us worse. It makes our relationships worth, worse. It makes our community worse. So now I'm going to tell you a story. A few years ago, I decided to join a gym. And I think it, then COVID must have happened um, just after that. But this is pre-COVID um, where you could work out in a gym without a mask on, which was very suffocating. I was going in the mornings, and I like peace sometimes. So if you ever catch me, like at Walmart, I'll put a hat on, or I'll put sunglasses on, or I'll just try to do something. I felt bad for Allison when we first got married. A pastor gets to know a lot of people, and I'm super thankful for a lot of people. But a lot of people in a pastor's life come into my life, and a lot of people go out of my life, and that's okay. But sometimes we're newly married, and... Uh, People come up to me and all of a sudden date night is wrecked because someone wants to talk to me a bunch. And, and I can appreciate that, but I also have to honor my family and my wife and other times. So when I was at the gym, I put on my, I figure if you're at the gym with your earphones on, I'll see people at the gym. The best I'll do at the gym for you, I'll walk over, I'll give you a fist bump and I'm going to walk away. So I'm at the gym and I'm walking on a treadmill. I've lifted, I'm walking on a treadmill and do you ever, so you're just sitting there walking and I'll be praying or thinking, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for my family, I'll think through different things. But have you ever been somewhere and you know beyond a shadow of doubt, you don't want to look, but you know someone's staring right at you. And you just feel it, you just, you know something bad is there. And so I'm on the treadmill and I'm walking, the treadmills are all pointing this way, and I feel a presence about this close. And I'm thinking, there is no way I'm, I'm on a treadmill, I'm walking, there's no way someone is staring at me. And finally I look over and, and there's a dude right here and he's not walking on his treadmill, he's facing me, so he's facing me and he's staring at me. So I get off the treadmill, I take my headphones out and I say, sup, how can I help you? And he says the words that you never want to hear at any gym, at any moment. And the words he says was this. Looks like you could use a little help. 
That either implies that I am doing something wrong or that I'm not achieving really any goals in the gym. Either way, it's clear I'm on a treadmill and this dude's looking at me and he thinks that guy is a complete idiot who knows nothing about being here or anything that he wants to do that's positive in his life. He explains that he's a new fitness instructor at the gym. So this isn't just a regular person, this is a fitness instructor, and he's trying to sell me now on a product that he's trying to promote. Okay, well, I have to give him credit. Everybody's trying to grind. Everybody's trying to make a living. So I just politely decline, you know, I get on the treadmill. Days later, I was thinking about this for like, I was thinking about this for a while. Like, what? Help me understand this. And then it hit me. He was the Christian, and I was the non-Christian. And it was very intrusive what he did, and I didn't like it. And then I came up with this. We come out of nowhere with no context and no relationship to sell them something they don't currently feel a need for. Does that make sense? Does anybody feel that way when it comes to evangelism? Because I do. It's like, so I'm walking on this treadmill and he just comes out of nowhere and just crack, like blindsides me and I'm not ready. I didn't sign up for anything. I didn't ask. It'd be one thing if I went over and I'm like, hey dude, you look huge. What's, uh, maybe help me out. Should I eat more chicken? I mean, put me on a diet. I don't know. Just get me going on this deal. That's, you know, you ask. If you ask, you ask. But I'm a big believer that if you don't ask, maybe you're not asking. Maybe, you're, maybe you don't want the answer if you're not asking. And so I think all of us, especially when you're newly saved as a Christian, you're super excited about Christ and you're like telling people. And then after a little bit, you find out you torqued off a bunch of people. You didn't know. You didn't mean it. You were just excited about God saving you and you want them saved as well. Now, don't hear me when I say this. I'm not criticizing any form of evangelism. I think God uses everything. I think our efforts are feeble. I think we need him to work, and all efforts are great. Some people are called to do things that others aren't called to do, and I'm okay with that. I'm just admitting this. I'm a really normal, regular person, and I searched and searched and searched for an evangelism plan that worked for me. When I was in college, we had to do a missions, I went to a Christian college, and we would do a one-week missions trip in the fall. So you would sign up to what you would do. And one of those missions trips, we went to, into East LA to do uh, service projects and some things with kids in a church in East LA. And one of the days, they put us on assignment, me and a, a, another guy, and we were to go door-to-door and evangelize. So we would just go door to door and knock and just like try. That, that's hard. That's hard. And I don't know that that's my calling. I'm not saying it's not anybody's calling. Unfortunately, what we found was that we would go door to door. And then uh, for whatever reason, we look back, we look back and about five doors down, there's two other dudes going door to door. And they have white shirts and they're both elders of their church. I wasn't even an elder of my church, so they have a name badge. That must mean they're more important. So we're like, oh, okay, the, the Mormons are up in here, and we're here, so we're going to go backwards, and we're going to have a face-off. So then we turn around, and now we're going back towards the Mormons, and now it's going to get on. So it's completely on. We're in the middle of East LA Street, and it's theology time. And guess who changed their minds? Nobody. It was a big fight. But it ended with this. And they won. It ended with this. The Mormons saying, well, you two are here for how long? We said a week. They said, we're here for a year. And after that, there'll be two more. And after that, there'll be two more. And after that, there'll be two more. And when we hit these homes... 
monthly, year after year after year. And then I hit him right in his face. I'm kidding. I didn't. (laughs) Doesn't that fire you up though? That got me, when I was like 19, I'm like raging. Like, Father, how can this, strike him dead right now. Just do something spectacular. So when it comes to evangelism, I just want a way that I can tell people about Christ that matches who I am. And I'm just regular. So I'm going to give you the average guy's way of doing evangelism today. Here we go. Point number one, Jesus wants to save people. Point number one. I think that's fantastic. In other words, I mean, I want to save people. That's fantastic. But way more important than me, Jesus wants to save people. The king of the universe who has all the power, who has all the calling, who has everything that he needs says in Luke 19, 10, I came to seek and save the lost. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus loves people and Jesus wants to save people. Totally apart from me. So take myself out of the picture completely. I don't even exist. Jesus is going to save people. He just is. So, Rather than me thinking that I'm like like building a product line or a business where I need to get people saved, I would rather we all take ourselves off the deck there for a moment and just say, Jesus wants to save people. How do I get on that assembly line? Just help me on that path. If Jesus is saving people already, well, then just, I want to be like, just point me in the right direction. Just show me who you want to save and I'll go talk to them. So number one, Jesus wants to save people. Number two, the Holy Spirit has been given to you so that you can be a witness. When you repented of your sin and you trusted in Christ as your savior, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Please stop believing people who say otherwise. It is unbiblical. It is not right. The Holy Spirit is not a second filling. You receive the Holy Spirit At your moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit indwells you. The Holy Spirit empowers you. The Holy Spirit leads you, directs you, guides you, seals you for all of eternity. And he empowers you to be a witness. You can be a witness for Jesus. In other words, you have more horsepower than you're giving yourself credit for. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In other words, you are not left alone in this process. So it's like, um, you ever seen a really hot car and you're like, oh, that's the new whatever. But it didn't come with the right engine. It was like, it was like the stock engine. So it's like a really hot car. And then you look at and you're like, oh, they just got the, the V6, that wasn't really, you know, well, that, you could have gotten more horsepower with that car. But it's a cool looking car, but it, have, it doesn't have the horsepower that you want. And in that same car, you can upgrade it and you can get a real engine in that car. And it has a lot of horsepower. And some of you have repented of your sin, trusted in Christ, received the Holy Spirit. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit and you are not tapping into the horsepower that is available to you. You are more than you're giving yourself credit for and you can access this power and I'm going to show you how to access power in a moment. So one, Jesus wants to save people. Two, the Holy Spirit has given, been given to you so that you can be a witness. Three, it's God who does the heavy lifting. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. It is, a not, is not a result of works so that nobody in this room may boast. God does the heavy lifting. You're not a salesman. I do not like feeling like a salesman for Jesus. It's like the worst feeling on earth when you're talking to someone and they're like, they're negative and you're feeling like you're like having to defend Christ or sell him to someone 
who doesn't really want him. If they don't want him, walk. We'll say what you can do here in a little bit. But you're not here to sell. You're not trying to make a living selling Jesus. You, everybody in this room, is a son or daughter of God. You're just a son and a daughter. And you're telling other people about your father. You're telling other people about Jesus. You're not a salesman. But we have to understand that salvation is not a natural work. It is a supernatural work. And last time I checked, nobody in this room, and certainly not me, is supernatural. We are just natural. We're just regular people. Jesus wants to save people. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to empower us to be a witness. But it's God who does the heavy lifting. We're just the messengers. I used to, years ago, I would be seeing, I would try, try to talk to people about Jesus and it just gets frustrating at times about, well, why is he not working and what's going on and why am I not using the right words? Am I not answering the questions in the right way? That's natural man thinking. That's all natural. The natural man says, if I plant a certain seed, water it a certain way, give it enough sunlight, and, and make everything right, it will grow. And God says, that's a natural way to grow a garden. I grow lives supernaturally. So we need supernatural power to do this. So number one, uh, my fourth point's the key, and then we're gonna, we're gonna camp on point number four here in a bit. One, Jesus wants to save people. You have to believe that. Two, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Three, God does a heavy lifting. But four, prayer opens doors. I'm gonna, we're going to go through two key verses here that are really important. I, I, I am not saying prayer opens doors like it's, like it's a magic. We're going to go through two verses here that are very specific. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. You can write this down. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful, uh, watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how one ought to answer each person." Notice this, Paul asks for prayer and he says, I need you to pray that God will open a door so that I can declare the mystery of Christ. What's the mystery of Christ? Ephesians 3, 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The mystery of Christ is the what? is the gospel. So when Paul says, pause for a minute, this is the apostle Paul. You realize that they did actual miracles in different places where they visited? Okay, I, don't ha I can't do that. I have yet to do an actual miracle in front of someone. And then they're like, uh, I don't know how you did that, but clearly God empowers you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna believe in God. Paul says he needs people to pray so that God can open a door for him to declare the gospel. Prayer opens doors. It really does. How often do you pray for people to find Jesus? Are you asking for doors and opportunities to be opened to you? You can pray for people you live with, people you work with, people you play with, people who are friends. You could pray for people who serve you, people who you serve, people you like, people who like you, people you don't like, people who don't like you, people who you shop with or eat with or you go out with. You need to be praying and watching. So I'm going to credit Neil Brower, our old superintendent, for this. Pray and watch. 
I'm going to give you this as what I believe is a regular person's evangelism plan. What I'm going to ask you to do starting today. Some of you do this already. Some of you don't. You can use your phone. I used to use a book, but you can use your phone now and, and, and write notes in your phone. I don't, need, I don't know how many of you do that, but you can do that now. So you can write notes in your phone. I'm asking you to do this. If Paul needed prayer for God to open a door, then you need prayer for God to open a door. I want you to start meeting people, writing their name down, and praying for them. That's your job. When you meet someone at a shopping center, you meet someone, write their name down. Just say, Father, I'm going to... I met Chris. I'm going to start praying for Chris. I don't know why. I don't know how. You, you brought him into my life. Whatever it is, a friend's a friend. They came over. They visited. Whatever it is. And I'm going to start praying. But I'll tell you what it does is I am a firm believer that if you ask God in prayer to open up a door, that he will do that in a way that's more natural than, what, than me going to someone's door and just, Hi, I'm here to tell you something that you don't care about. And I need to sell you on Jesus who you didn't ask me about Jesus. Is that an okay thing to do? Sure. Spread the word. Spread it. Throw the seed. Scatter the seed. However the seed is scattered. But I'm here to tell you I've tried that. And it's not for me. Because I'm just, I just don't pull it off well. For me, I start a fight. That's what I do. So for me, it's better that I meet people and pray for them and Try to show them love. And, and the funny thing about if I meet someone and I'm praying for them, guess what? Then the next time I meet them or run into them, I've been praying for them, right? Like they've been in my, my mind. They've been on my heart. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, hey, how are you? Oh, I remembered. Now all of a sudden people say, oh, my grandmother is hurting. Hey, go up to them. I prayed for your grandmother this week. How is she doing? Whatever it is. But I don't have to sell them on Christ I'm basically saying, Jesus, here's the people you're saving. I'm just tired of yelling at this person. And Jesus is like, I'm over here saving these people. You got to stop yelling at this person for a time and start praying for them. Because I'll tell you how many times it's happened where I'm like, I'm praying for these five people. And I'm like, I like these people. They're awesome people. I'm praying for them. I want them saved. And God brings me a dud over here who I wasn't praying for, don't really like that much. And I'm like, wait a minute, God, you're sort of bringing this person, but I wasn't praying for that person. I was praying for this person. I'm praying for these, save these. And all of a sudden this person's coming, coming, coming. And then asking questions, I'm like, seriously, God, you're gonna save this guy where I'm praying for the people I like. But if I had a more watchful attitude of praying and watching, it would be me watching. God, what are you doing? Help me to observe what you're doing, not what I want to do. What I want to do is build this highway over here, but God might say, I'm not doing that right now. I'm just building a thing over here. And you can jump on, that'd be fantastic, or you can not jump on. Multiple times this happened in the New Testament with who? Gentiles. Save the Jews, save the Jews, save the Jews. We want to save the Jews. And Jesus like, I went to the house. They all told me to get lost. We're going to go talk to Gentiles now. The book of Acts is full of debates and arguments. And I'm assuming unless someone's Jewish in the audience, we're all recipients of Gentile love. That Jesus says, I know you guys want this plan over here to save the Jews, but that's not my plan right now. I have a new plan, and you're going to have to open your hearts and your minds and your hands to these new people because they're dying without me. This is really, really important. I don't know that there's any, for me, there has not been any better evangelism plan than praying and writing names down and just say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pray for this person every day, every day, every day, every day. And me watching and going, you know what? God, you seem to be working in this person who I wasn't, they're not on my radar, but you seem to be working in, a, in an area 
that I, I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something, and so I'm going to kind of come over here as well. So I'm asking a doable evangelism plan, pray and watch and watch and pray. Being alert to what's going on around you, being alert and sensitive to the Holy Spirit, empowering you, trying to watch where God is working instead of me just always like grabbing things and trying to make them work for me, me jumping on God's way of doing things and saying, okay, Father, you want to go in this way? I don't understand it right now, but I'll go your way because it's clear that you're doing something over here. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you for each person who's here. I want to pray for them, Father, that we're supposed to be evangelists, but we're not supposed to scare people. And I don't think we're supposed to be scared or, or bothered either. I don't think we're supposed to leave doing the work of the ministry and every time feel like a salesman. So Father, help us with this. Help us as we try to uh, tell people about you and at the same time be sensitive enough to see what are you doing? Where are you working? Father, as always, we will be praying we ask that you would open doors and then we would be faithful to walk through those doors. It's in Christ's name that we pray.